God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98 FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Here's a few tips in finding Richard's podcast. Go to the World Wide Web at k98talk.com. Scroll down to Podcasts. When Podcast comes up, look for a red button with a white plus sign in it. Open this content in a new window by clicking the link. When a new website appears, click on Shows. Then scroll to God's Pure Word of Faith. Click on the name and a list of programs will come up. That's it. Now enjoy God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. You're listening to God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Richard will guide you through the Bible and help you find God's purpose for your life. Now here's teacher and author Richard Harden. Welcome this morning to God's Pure Word of Faith. I'm Richard Harden. I'll be here with you now a couple of hours. I have a lot of uh, information and scriptures to share with you. First, I want to just thank the management of K98 Talk for this great opportunity. Well, the management and the Lord. You know, thank the Lord and the management, you know, because uh, both of them involved in me being here for this opportunity to share with you today. Such a great opportunity to share God's Word around the world. And uh, I don't know any place I'd rather be than right here now sharing with you. Uh, Before I start the message today, this is going to be the third message in a series on ministers and God's Word. Uh, As ministers, we're supposed to be sharing God's pure Word. In fact, it says if we don't, we're going to be found a liar. Let's see, Proverbs 35 and 6 says, God's Word is pure, a shield them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not to His Word, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. And the way we're reproved and found a liar is that God won't back up what we say. And uh, across our nation, uh, we have so many ministers on radio and television things. I'm just going to be sharing with you again this morning some of the 
uh, messages or portions of messages I've heard and then bringing scripture uh, along with it to let you decide then what you think about it and everything. Well, before I do that, though, I want to share with you about my uh, website where I have I've written six books and um, on my website there's a tab to them and also 18 videos on YouTube. And there's a link from my website to those 18 video videos and I have 20 something messages and a blog that also has a link off of the website and if you want to let's see read using Kindle you can also put my name Richard A. Harden in and my books will come up on Kindle but right now I just want to share with you about my website before we get started here visit Richard's website at raharden.com that's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. Uh, in the first two messages in this series of, of uh, ministers and their messages on the radio and television, I uh, talk mainly about grace because grace, you know, uh, is how we're saved. The Spirit of Christ coming into our heart and His, Jesus says, my words are spirit and they're life. And when the Spirit of Christ comes into our heart, His words then are alive in us the living Word of God and he creates in us a new heart a new life as uh, prophesied in Ezekiel 36 26 where it says a new heart also will I give you a new spirit will I put within you I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in you so grace is uh, one of the greatest uh, things we can be studying throughout the scriptures is how to receive grace and the way we receive grace into our heart it's it's based on your choice we have to uh, well Ephesians 2 8 says for by grace are you saved through faith so this morning I'll be dis discussing faith a lot but but faith is simply when we hear God's Word Romans 10 17 faith comes by hearing hearing the Word of God We've got all kind of comments about that. But see, when you hear something, you have to make a judgment. You have to accept or reject. In uh, Psalms 119.9, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to God's word. And when the children of Israel, coming out of slavery, came up to the promised land, and, and they failed to trust God and enter into the promised land, it says in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19, and they failed to enter in because of an evil heart of unbelief. And it says in there, an evil heart of departing from the living God. So when we know God's will, and we know God or know God's word, and we reject it, we're rejecting the living God. Because when God sends us a message, it's not like a teletype or a fax or an email or a text or something. It's God himself coming to us, manifesting his presence in our mind and forming in us what we call thoughts to give us that message that he's speaking to us. And so we aren't getting a message from him. The message is him. In uh, John chapter 1, verse one through th verses 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was a word, and the word was God, and the word was God. Now see, and Christ is a living word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 it says uh, speaking about Moses it says Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt. So see so Christ was God's spoken living word to Moses and he esteemed that greater than all the wealth of Egypt. When God said let there be light Christ went forth and created light. Christ is always the power creating power of God, First Corinthians uh, chapter one, verse twenty-four says, "Christ, the power of God, see the creating power of God, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The wisdom being God's pure spoken word. That's why His spoken word 
uh, it says, shield them, trust him, add thou not to his word, lest he reprove thee and be found a liar. If we change God's word and add to it or take from it, see, it's our word then. And we don't have any power in our words. It's his word, and we should be speaking his word like Second Corinthians 10, 20, excuse me, Second Corinthians 5, 20 says that uh, we're ambassadors for Christ. Now, see, we can carry his word and share his word, and he'll back up his word through us as much as he backed up his word through Jesus or any of the prophets, any of the people of the Old Testament, New Testament. He will back up his word. He even backed up his word through a donkey one time back in the book of Numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. But if we're speaking his pure word, he'll back it up. But if we change anything and add it, add to it, it's our word which has no power. That's why we, as his ambassadors and representatives here on earth as Christians, we should be seeking to be careful with how we uh, say things and, and try to say them as correctly as possible. He does say in Isaiah that God will also back up the counsel of his representatives. Now, so that means like when we go out to share a testimony of our salvation, how Christ came into my heart and he created me a, a, such a new, great heart. And, and I started recognizing that when my ideas and things about fancy cars and about, you know, uh, family life. And when I picked up the scripture, started reading them, it just came alive to me. See, I started recognizing, man, something's happened inside of me. Something has changed. He created in me the new heart, the new life that's talked about in the scriptures. So uh, when when we share that testimony with others, he'll back up that counsel too. As long as we don't, you know, go out to some extreme or something like that. As long as we're, you know, doing the best we can to share what happened to us at salvation. Because, see, it is so fantastic, so great. We could never explain it completely. But to just share the great joy and everything. Now, grace is... God's love to us in our heart. Mercy is God's love to us and on us. And like it says in Isaiah 59, 21, it says that uh, my spirit is upon thee. This is my covenant. My spirit is upon thee and my words are in thy mouth. See, that's mercy. His spirit on us, on people. And um, even today, even though we're in the New Testament, we still have mercy every day. When you know, you go out and drive a car, and if you don't have a wreck, you know something like this and everything, it's God's mercy of protecting you as you did that. When you eat food, it's God's mercy. Uh, when you, you know, uh, are protected from things like this, that He He protects us so much with mercy that we probably wouldn't have any idea all the great things He's doing for us all day long. Now, and then it says in. Psalms, let's see, Psalms 25.10. Mercy and truth are all the ways of the Lord to those that accept his covenants and obey his testimonies. Now, so it means all the godly people of the Old Testament, all they had was like Isaiah said, God's Spirit on them, around them, protecting them, you know, like an angel of the Lord and camps around about them that fear him and delivers them. Uh, his spirit around them, protecting them, delivering them, and his words, his living word to them, Christ, like to Moses. It says, Moses esteemed the riches of Christ greater than all the wealth of Egypt. Now, that's God's love to us, around us, and protecting us. And in our heart, when we humble ourselves and invite him to come in, ask him to forgive us for our sins, and uh, come save me, forgive me of my sins, come into my heart, you know, I commit my life to you. You know, when you pour out your heart to the Lord, and ask forgiveness. He comes into your heart then, and that's what we call a work of grace. Now, for the rest of our time here on earth, after we become a child of God, and He puts His Spirit in us, we should be seeking daily to grow closer to Him in understanding and knowledge. In Second Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, you know, that we grow in, you know, peace and joy like this as we learn more about God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we study and learn more and more about Him, well, Second Peter 1, 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So as we receive more of His living Word in us, we grow to be more like Jesus. Now, in all these different uh, ways or something like this that the Lord comes to us with His love and the things He does for us and everything, 
there is only one way that we can respond to him and be pleasing to him. In Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jeremiah 29, 30, You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. The same words in Deuteronomy 4, 29, You shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. See, so <clears throat> we only have one way that we can respond back to God and be pleasing to him. And that is faith. And again, Romans 10, 17 now says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. But it's not just hearing his word in one ear and out the other, and hearing and knowing his word intellectually. I was in church 20-something years, and I'd heard a lot of God's word. I knew a lot of God's word and everything. But I, did, I had not received his word into my heart. When I was nine years old, and I went forth and said, I'd love the Lord. I want to be a Christian. And, you know, yes, I want to get baptized and everything. I did. That didn't make me a Christian then. I'd, I'd give anything if I could go back and, and, and do that again some way or another and, and actually become a child of God then. But can't go back. Twenty-something years later, when I cried out to the Lord one night for God to forgive me of my sins and to come into my heart and save me and everything like that, or I thought I was kind of rededicating my life to the Lord then, but I got so sinful and everything like that. You know, I, I was just turned to the Lord. Lord, just please forgive me. Show me you're real. You know, and, and he did. But he changed my heart, and it shocked me so much because I never realized I really wasn't a Christian all those years. Uh, I thought I was. It changed my ideas about cars and money and family situations, things like this, so much so, so quick. In just a couple of uh, days after, I started recognizing some of these fantastic changes. And it kind of shocked me. I picked up the Bible and it just came alive to me when it started saying about this changed heart. And said, That's what just happened to me. That's the first time I ever really prayed and talked to the Lord personally about my sins and everything. And it scared me then. All those years I'd come so close to dying. But now, faith is the only way by acceptance and obedience to God's word. It's impossible to please God without faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. See, when we accept it, we're a sinner, and Christ's the answer, and we must humble ourselves and invite him to come in. And then when we do that, see, we're receiving uh, his message, his words of salvation into our heart. And His Jesus says, my words are spirit and their life in John 6, 63. So when his spirit and his life comes into us, that's when we're engrafted into the family of God. We're born in his family. We're children of God. We're not just a... Uh, another creature of God, something like that. We were creatures of God all along. He loved us with a perfect love. But see, now we're His children. His Spirit in us. And we'll always have His Spirit in us. He will never leave us again or forsake us. And, and so when we die this physical death, our bodies just fall off the physical bodies and we just continue right on with the Lord and the Spirit. Now, so the gospel only profits us through faith. Anything we hear from God, it only profits us if we accept and receive it into our heart. Like Hebrews 4, 2 says, For in us was the gospel preached as well as in them. But the word preached in them did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So when you hear uh, the gospel, when you hear that Christ is the answer and the, you know, you're a sinner and things like this, how do you mix it in faith? Well, you receive it in agreement into your heart. You know, like your mother tells you, eat that spinach. Well, you might eat it and write and complain. That's not receiving it in your heart. So you might eat it just, you know, satisfy her while she's standing there nearby. But see, receiving it into your heart means you you take it. It becomes a part of you. Jesus said, my words abide in you and you abide in me. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done. See, our his word abiding in us at our choice and we're receiving him in. See, but we've got to do something for salvation. You know, you hear people say about grace, God's unmerited favor. That's not true. God's unmerited favor is Hebrews, I mean, excuse me, Romans 4 2, where it says God blesses lost people to draw them to repentance. He blesses lost people, you know, out rejecting Him and everything to draw them to repentance. But grace is a work of God's Spirit, His love in our heart to create a new heart, a new life. Now, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith. Your acceptance and obedience to God's word into your heart. Words are life. They are alive in you. They create in you the new heart and life. 
see so you do have to do something you have to humble yourself and agree that you're a sinner you have to humble yourself to God and agree that Jesus is your answer then you have to humble yourself and actually call out to God confessing your sins asking forgiveness inviting him to come into your heart so there is something you must do for salvation now you can't earn your salvation you can't go out and do a lot of good works and, and let that be uh, accounted to you for salvation no but you must humble yourself before the living God and invite his word into your heart in Isaiah um, not Isaiah excuse me Psalms 138 2 says God has exalted his word above all his names we call out to the greatest name Jesus he sends back to us in his living word and he exalts his word above all else well that's because he and his word are the same now so faith that's what we're going to be discussing this morning and, and we're going to be discussing what is being taught around our nation about faith some of the things that are being said you know uh, and this is so serious because that 20 something years I was in church uh, hearing messages every Sunday I was in Baptist children's homes I had to go every time the door was open revivals in the summer and I mean the spring and the fall 10 times a week like that and hearing all these messages and it never I never even imagined that I wasn't a Christian because at age 9 I'd gone forward got baptized and done all this you know, and joined the church but when I did receive Christ in my heart it was so different to changed heart to change life and everything like that I said my goodness how come somewhere back there and, and all those sermons or something didn't I get the idea some way or another that hey you know I may not have really surrendered given my heart and life to the Lord but it never dawned on me and if you're listening today and you cannot remember back when you cried out to God and asked forgiveness of your sins and invited him to come into your heart I'm talking about you doing it personally now between you and God nobody else can do it for you and then you receive the response from the Lord in answer to your prayer of creating you a new heart and a changed life and everything if, if, if you can't remember that time say how on earth could you could you possibly be so full of sin and everything and call out to God ask him to forgive you and come into your heart and create a new heart a new life and put his spirit of love in you and you not know it you know I've, I've talked to people who received the changed heart not just me but others and everything like that you know it when he's come in you may not remember the exact day hour minute or something like that because it took me you know to kind of when things started happening to me after I prayed that night um, one thing happened the next day and the next day and I started saying hey something new has happened to me and all I could trace it back to was the answer to my prayer of Christ coming into my heart so if you can't remember that please start put that on the top of your list and start praying and seeking the Lord till you can know for sure that Christ lives in you now it says in Romans 8 9 now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ he is none of his and that's what it means when Jesus said you know you must be born again you must be born of the living word in your heart coming in creating and grafting you into the family of God you know uh, Ezekiel 36 26 is one of the best descriptions of grace I think there is in the scripture it says a new heart also I give you a new spirit will I put within you I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh and I'll put my spirit in you and that is the most important thing each of us here on earth should be seeking to know that we have received the changed heart not just we started made a choice and said hey I think I'll start going to church and being a good guy and carry my Bible and dress up and everything that, that's not becoming a Christian becoming a Christian is talking to the Lord about your sin getting your sins forgiven and raised cleansed off he forgives and forgets them he never remembers them anymore so a lot of people say God knows everything he doesn't he forgives and forgets our sins and he says that all through the scripture and he'll never remember them against us anymore never remember them anymore he says as far as the east is from the west but anyway now as I go through some of these scriptures and everything I want to point out the scriptures that uh, these gentlemen are talking about when they you know make these comments and everything everything is not a faith is sin so if, if we're doing something you know and the Lord and we haven't heard his word or we've changed his word or something like that 
um, this kind of scared me when I first became a Christian because I said, "Do I have? Am I having faith or something like this?" Because I didn't feel like a you know wooden sinning or something like that. I, I felt like you know everything not a faith is sin. I better investigate this. We inherit the promises by faith. It says in Hebrews six twelve. Uh, you mean they don't just come to me automatically? No, the promises come to us as God's children by by faith, by reading them or hearing them and accepting them into our hearts. See, we, we've got to know the promises to be able to claim them and them come alive in our heart. Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God, but only if we accept and receive it into our heart. So we, if we're going to be walking by faith, like faith, like it says in so many scriptures and everything, to walk by faith, the just shall live by faith. Now back in Hebrews 10, 38 and in Romans 1 17 it's not just hearers now hearing God's word and then you deciding what you're going to do we got to receive God's word and try to live by it like it says you know pray for those who despitefully use you you know don't argue and fight with them it says uh, forgive others you know as hard as it is to it's his word so we must seek Lord please help me forgive that person help me because I know it's your will for me to forgive them please help me to that's one of the hardest things to do is forgive someone and we have victory over the world through our faith. And 1 John 5, 4 says that, that it's a victory over the world when we accept and receive and obey God's word into our heart and, you know, live accordingly. Victory over the world. Because, see, well, it's just, that's the only way to walk by faith, by acceptance and obedience to his word. Now, faith doesn't come by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing like some of the people teach. Faith comes by accepting what you hear. Now, you may have to hear it several times to accept it, but, you know, the first time you hear from God about anything, you can receive it to faith if you will just open your heart and receive it. Now, I'll take a short break here, and I'll be right back, and we'll get started on this. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on k 98 Talk. Dot com. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. 
If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. Welcome back. I'm Richard Harden, and now let's see. Getting started in our message today, the importance of this is, as I mentioned before, when when people are sharing different things that um, are, well, different than what the Scripture says and, and using um, improper words or something. For an example, in one of the messages before, you know, for us to say that Christ died on the cross for us, and see, that's not really true. Because, see, Jesus died on the cross for us. And when uh, Jesus was on the cross, right before he died, the Spirit of Christ, God in him, the Spirit of Christ in Jesus, left him. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And during that short period of time then, from the time that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, left his heart, and he was alone on the cross, see, Separate, I mean, sin is a separation of the heart from God. He was in total sin. That's when he took the sins of the world on. When Christ left him, he was there alone, without the Spirit of Christ in his heart. That separation of his father, you know, from his father and from Christ, you know, in him, he, you know, it just hurt him so bad. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And during the rest of the time uh, that he was there, it was him taking our sins and our separations that. We don't have to go through that anymore. Once we receive Christ in our heart, like I mentioned earlier, it, when we die, we just leave this physical body, like the Apostle Paul says, and just go to be with the Lord. You know, just continue right on the Spirit. But that was that separation that Jesus took for us when he fulfilled the uh, scapegoat function of the Old Testament sacrifices. And every sacrifice, they would have like two animals. One would be the sacrifice, and the other would be the scapegoat. And after they killed the sacrifice, uh, sacrificial animal and everything that took the blood of it and everything like that they would pray on the other animal and lead it off into the wilderness to take the you know sins of the people that they would pray over that so it was a scapegoat going off into the wilderness or the bird flying out into the country uh, if it was for leprosy or something but anyway see Jesus took that during those short moments or minutes or whatever it was however long it was after Christ left his heart. So see, just saying though that Christ died for us, it, it's, it, it's not really true because see, on the cross, Jesus and Christ were different. Jesus was a man Jesus. Christ was the living God in him. And Christ, the living God, left him. And the man Jesus took our sins. That's why God was so pleased with him to exalt him to the fullness of the Godhead bodily. See, so now today, Jesus and Christ are the same. But when you're telling people things about what happened in the Scripture and everything, be careful to share with them, you know, the difference between Jesus and Christ and, you know, whatever. So it cuts down on confusion. And uh, any kind of confusion that the devil can cause in Christianity is great because the devil hates Jesus. The devil hates God. But... but uh, the devil doesn't want Jesus to get any of the honor and respect that he should. So he'll do anything he can to uh, uh, change things around and, and cause Jesus to miss that respect because Jesus is the only one that was able to live that perfect walk of faith. He says, I only do what my father says and I only uh, say what my father tells me to say. You know, like that, the perfect walk of faith without sin. With all the temptations the devil brought his way during those years and everything. So he hates Jesus because what Jesus did for us. He did it for us so we don't have to go through that that uh, separation of our hearts from his father anymore. And we're adopted into the family of God in a sense from our heaven I mean from our earthly fathers and parents. But now we're children of God. Look how much greater that is that the people of the Old Testament didn't become uh, a child of God with Christ in their heart and God's spirit in them. No, they were called children of God a lot of times and everything, but it was a different concept then, but not now. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 26, again, a new heart also will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart of it, give you a heart of place, I'll put my spirit in you. That's when we become a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus. Now, and our purpose today should be, well, Roman, excuse me, 
Psalms 1130, where it says that uh, the fruit of the righteous tree of life, he that winneth souls is wise. Our purpose today, each of us as ambassadors for Christ, should be that we're sharing with people and that people are coming into the Lord. Look back in your life. How many trees of life are back behind you? People who have received Christ in their heart from you sharing with them, praying with them, encouraging them, and everything like this. See, the fruit of the righteous tree of life, he that winneth souls is wise. So seek wisdom. Seek to learn to be able to be, you know, more specific and exact in, in your wording to share with people the truth. Now, and the Apostle Paul says, you know, uh, the differences between um, all these different beliefs and everything that people had in his day, he said it made them like babes in Christ. And that's the way it is with us too. Three or four hundred different denominations and everything. Uh, different groups like this. One saying speaking the tongues of God. One saying speaking the tongues of the devil and back and forth. It, that Jesus doesn't heal like he used to heal today and things doesn't work in our life personally. All these different things are being taught in our society. When people on the outside or a lost person looks in, they see the Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Nazarene, you know, disciples of this and Church of God this and the Catholics and this and back and forth. And they all have such different beliefs and everything. There's not supposed to be different beliefs. Ephesians 4, verse 4 says there's one body, one faith, one spirit. Uh, we're only supposed to have one faith. You know, God's not going to tell you something different about a scripture than he tells me. He might use a, a scripture someday to, to guide us into our personal walk with him because see, each of us have a special holy calling. 2 Timothy 1 9, he saved us, called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace created in Christ Jesus. So as he's leading us to that, he may use some scripture from me to guide me into that holy calling, yes, for me, but it's not a general, you know, meaning of that whole scripture to everybody, something like that. Well, but about the scriptures, he's going to tell us all the things, all of, I mean, all the same meanings and everything. It says, until we come into a perfect man to measure stature of fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children. That's in Ephesians 4 verses 11 through 14. Then uh, he goes on to say you know that we should all be well like in Jesus prayer right before he left the earth. It says uh, John 17 chapter 10. <clears throat> excuse me. John 17 verse 10 to 15. And all are thine and thine are mine. I am glorified in them. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. See, one in belief, one in, you know, knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, you know, like that. We shouldn't have all these different beliefs. In fact, you ask um, next 10 or 15 people you meet, ask them what salvation means to them or just how you get salvation. And you're going to get 9 or 10 different answers or something like that. Even if you ask people the same denomination like that because people are just not studying the word and we're going to have to answer for it. That's the seriousness of it because after 20 something years thinking I was a Christian then becoming a Christian, it is so different that it scared me all those years I lived thinking I was a child of God, a Christian, and I wasn't. Now, and so Jesus' prayer is that we be, you know, just like him and his Father. Uh, again, they shall be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. See, so this is very important as ambassadors for Christ, ambassadors that we share the complete word. Romans 12:5, the Apostle Paul says, So we being many... Are one body in Christ. We don't have a right to have all these different denominations and everything. Every minister that's teaching and preaching God's word, it says in Ephesians 4, says every preacher, teacher, pastor, evangelist is charged with bringing all Christian denomination groups into the unity of one faith and fullness of Christ. Listen to Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, till we all come into a unity of the faith, that one faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And he said that we henceforth be no more children or babes in Christ, tossed to and fro, cared about by ever 
wind of doctrine. See, so our society, the Apostle Paul would say, is just babes in Christ. And not only that, you know, when the, our society is being led by all these PhDs and, you know, in, in the theology and, you know, they got their doctorate in this theology and they got to the doctrine and that, people don't go to these seminaries to learn God's pure word. They go to a Baptist seminary to learn how to interpret the Bible according to Baptist belief. They go to Presbyterian seminaries to learn how to interpret the Bible according to Presbyterian beliefs. They go to Catholic seminaries to learn to teach and preach it according to the Catholic. See, they aren't there with the purpose of truly finding God's pure word. They're there to figure out and how the best uh, preach and teach that word according to their denominational beliefs. See, the beliefs come first, and they're there at the seminaries and everything so that they can, you know, get approved by all the teachers and preachers there. And when a person goes out there and they say, yes, this is a great man. He's got a doctorate, you know, a theology. But what it means is he's just passed a lot of these tests for a particular denomination, and he knows how to preach and teach what that denomination believes. With all these differences, they shouldn't be. Like I said, it should be one faith and everything now. So this is very serious that, you know, that we have so many differences like this. And, and uh, when ministers are out preaching and teaching like that, it should be backed up with God's Word. Let's take one uh, right here. I'm taking a lot of time to get to it. Faith. I mentioned you a while ago. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by Word of God, but only if you accept and receive His Word into your heart. Like, you know, the Romans, excuse me, I'm going so fast here that, um, Psalms 119.9 where it says wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to God's word and the children of Israel when they failed to cross into the promised land they were rejecting the living God his will his word to them it says they failed to enter in because of an evil heart of unbelief so if, you're here, if you hear God's word and reject it you're in unbelief if you hear God's word and receive it you're receiving it to faith that's what if faith is it's where the comes from the power and everything the, the victory over the world because as you receive God's word into your heart it, it, his living word then Jesus says my words are alive you know so the living word of God then is coming into your heart that's what faith is receiving the living word of God into your heart now there's a scripture which a lot of people say is uh, God's definition of faith ministers all across our country, and even some seminaries teach it. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is not a definition of faith. It's not a definition of anything. It's true what it's saying, but it, it's talking about faith. For an example, suppose uh, you and I were standing outside the road and we saw a windmill back over in, in a field, and the windmill blades are turning, and some young kid or something like it comes up and says, Mister, what's the definition of wind? And I'd turn around and say to him, now wind is a substance fulfilling our hope to turn those windmill blades even though we can't see it. Wind is the substance of things hoped for. See, that's why we put windmills out there is to, you know, have the wind turn the blades and generate electricity from the generator down below it. So our hope is that the wind will blow, turn the blades, we generate electricity, even though we can't see the wind. Now, now wind is the substance of things hoped for to fulfill our hopes of turning the windmill blades and generating electricity. And it's evident, and even though we can't see it, it's wind that does it. Now, see, that's not a definition of wind. you got to talk about molecules moving and different things like this, or like electricity. You go into your house tonight. It's dark. Our hope is that when we flip that light switch that it's connected in a way, in a circuit, that electricity will flow through the light and the light will light up, come on, and we can see in the room then. That's our hope. Now, but what's the definition of electricity? We'd say, well, electricity is a substance fulfilling our, hurt to, our, fulfilling our hope to turn the light on even though we can't see it. I say, that's not a definition of electricity. That's just telling us when, man, when electricity is manifested at that light. When we flip the switch, electricity is manifested in the light, flows through the light, the light comes on, and it's evident that there's electricity there or the light wouldn't come on, see? So 
that's not a definition of electricity though that electricity is a hope fulfilling our faith for the light to come on even though we can't see it that's not a definition now neither is Hebrews 11 1 a definition of faith Hebrews 11 1 said now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen so faith is the substance causing our hopes to be fulfilled even though we can't see it and then the rest of Hebrews chapter 11 the faith chapter tells how you know faith was in Abraham's life and you know a, a Jacob someone like that Moses and other people of the Old Testament like that it's the uh, faith chapter then you say where faith was manifested in all these people's lives now and we know it was faith because see faith was fulfilling their hopes and it was evident that it was the faith their acceptance and obedience to God's word that God was responding to like that and that's what we call faith faith is a you know the receiving God's word into our heart and allowing him to work in us in and the work of grace so uh, now Hebrews 11 1 is not a definition of faith but yet um, Jesse Duplantis says faith Hebrews 11 1 faith is things he says because you know faith is a substance of things hoped for evidence thing so his interpretation then is that the definition of faith then is faith is things no faith is the spirit fulfilling our hope even though we can't see it also uh, dr. Frederick Price definition of faith uh, Hebrews 11 1 now faith is substance things hoped for and evidence things not seen now see that's a true statement when our hopes are being fulfilled we can see you know the the manifestation of faith in our life because it's what's fulfilling our hopes our response to God's Word and everything now but Hebrews 11 1 is not a definition even though it's a true statement uh, David Engels of the Oasis radio network a uh, network of radio stations around uh, the United States stated faith is automatically there if you know God's will or word God brings everybody to a knowledge of his will for salvation and that doesn't mean everybody receives salvation see so it doesn't mean faith is there and like the scripture I read a while ago where it says you know that uh, faith well the the gospel preached to them did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it see so you can hear God's Word and it's not automatically faith just because you're hearing God's Word you know you can know a lot of God's Word I knew a lot of God's Word in those 20 something years I was in church but that wasn't faith to me so just hearing God's Word and hearing God's Word is not faith uh, Kenneth Hagin it says um, he's got a faith formula one two three four one say it two do it three receive it four tell it well see that what it what is it there you know the meaning of faith he says active force filled words they're containers of a force uh, faith filled words create reality no it's you receiving humbling yourself to God's Word that you're a sinner or humbling yourself to God's Word and he asks you to teach a Sunday school class say Lord I'd, I've never done that before but I'm gonna trust that you'll help me teach that class or calling you to preach I've never preached Lord I, can, I don't like speaking in front of people but if, if you ask me to preach Lord I, I'm gonna trust that you'll go with me and help me like that see when God speaks to you whatever it is and a call to service or or to quit smoking or to quit drinking or whatever like this when when God speaks to you and identifies himself to you that he wants you to do that see faith then comes when you humble yourself to his word and say yes Lord I will help me help me forgive that person help me to pray for that person that despitefully uses me you know help me to know how to react in this situation the way you want me to see that's faith faith is trying you know with all sincerity to receive his word into your heart and trusting that he will help you with whatever it is and when his spirit comes alive in you because Jesus says again my words are spirit and life see his life his spirit comes in us then in a work of grace in us that's why he says said to Apostle Paul my grace is sufficient for you because see 
God was going to put a love in Paul's heart that, that would work in his heart, the spirit and everything, that, that would carry him through all those persecutions he was receiving and everything. They left him for dead one time, stoned outside a city, and they thought he was dead now. They'd have kept stoning if it wasn't. So that's how terrible Apostle Paul was that night from their stoning. They thought he was dead or they would have kept on until they did. Next morning, he was up preaching God's word again, going to preach the love of Jesus. It says in the very verse after they left him there, it said disciples gathered around him. And then the next verse says, and he was up the next day like, well, the disciples, you know what they did. They prayed and talked to the Lord and had a little prayer meeting there and everything. And God just healed him, raised him up because he wasn't through with Paul yet. See, so receiving God's word to faith is receiving, you know, the living God into your heart because he and his word are the same. That's where we get the faith, the strength, you know, the victory over the world, receiving the living Christ, the living God into our heart and, and allowing him to come in. It's not these words of faith fill this and faith fill that and everything like that. No. But when he speaks them, they have the potential of coming in us and creating us in the, the power of the creator of the universe, Christ in us that created the universe. We have him in us in for it. So, uh, it's not just automatically faith when you hear God's word. Rod Parsley says, uh, I'm releasing to you the gift of faith. You can't give someone else uh, your acceptance and obedience to God's word. If I receive God's word into my heart here and, and I've, I've received his word to faith in me, I can't give that to you. I can tell you about it, encourage you, and hope that you'll do the same thing. But see, I can't give it to you. Boy, if I could, I'd, I'd be out right now running around giving it to people. You know, that just, that's something I'm releasing you, the gift of faith. The, the gift of faith is not something you have, you just give to people. The gift of faith is, you know, just when, when you receive his word into your heart, the gift then is why it says that um, grace is a free gift of God. I'm like, yeah, because when you receive... Uh, his God's word into your heart, that gift in your uh, spirit and the gift in your heart, the work of Christ comes as an automatic response to you receiving God's word into your heart. Uh, Joel Osteen one time said that uh, Mordecai spoke faith into Esther, spoke anointing into Esther. See, you can't speak faith into anybody else. You can speak God's word. And if they open their heart and receive it, yes, then they will receive faith from the God's word that you share with them. And that's why we as ambassadors should be sharing God's word correctly because if, if we change it, it's not God's word. So we share with them something that's not God's word. It's not going to do them any good. But we need to be sharing God's pure word. And then when they receive what we share, they're receiving God's pure word then into their heart. And that's what we call faith. Accepting and receiving the spirit of the living God, his word, Christ, into our heart. And like again, it says in 1 Corinthians one twenty four, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, the power of the creating, creator of the universe, Christ in us, our hope of glory. And then the, the wisdom, God's perfect, pure word. So we can speak words of faith to people. We can speak God's word pure to people, but we can't speak it into them. They have to make the choice. They have to make the choice to receive his words into their heart. Dr. Jeremiah and many other people, Dr. Stanley, like this, it says one of the first things a Christian must do is place their faith in Christ. Now, see, that is a senseless statement when you think about it. Because faith is what gets the Spirit of Christ into our heart. We receive God's word and accept it. Now, if somebody rejects God's word, like I said a while ago, you reject the words of the gospel, the living words of Christ, and you reject that, you can't get saved. Now, to mix it in faith, you hear the words of the gospel, you receive those words into your heart and say, Lord, please forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. Now, see, you have then received those words by faith into your heart to faith in your heart. If you had rejected them, it had been unbelief. See, it's not an automatic just because you hear God's word. It, it's unbelief if you reject it and say, well, I'll wait till I get out of college. I'll wait till I get married. I'll wait till I get my life straightened out. See, that's rejection. The same words, which is unbelief. There's not going to be any uh, 
well, hell's going to be full of, uh, full of believers. People who have come to the knowledge and believe and know that it's God's will and word for them to receive Christ in their heart. And then, like 2 Thessalonians 2.10, the Apostle Paul says, they reject the love of those words. They reject the spirit of those words, and they perish. See, so what? Uh, everybody in hell or lake of fire is going to have a time in their life when God had brought them to a knowledge of Him, because like in Romans 1.20 it says, we're all without excuse. It's, and um, Titus 2.11 says, the grace of God that bring us salvation appeared to all men. But then like the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and 11, uh, that people perish because they reject the love of the truth. They reject God's message of love to them for salvation. Now, so saying here, one of the first things you must do is place their faith in Christ. Faith is not something you have that you place here and place there. Uh, like some people say there's faith in you know, a, a, a worldly faith or something like that. No, it's not. They've made that up because, see, faith, it says in the Scriptures, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. So when you think of faith, you only think of the Word of God. Either you accept His Word to faith into your heart or you reject it unbelief. Now, so, and the way you recognize this, then, when preachers say that uh, place your faith here and place your faith there, see, what they're saying is, you already have faith, it's just you make the choice of where you place it. And see, that's not true. When you receive the faith of God's words into your heart of salvation, then those words coming into your heart that you've accepted in then come are alive and they create in you the new heart, the new life, the work of grace for salvation. And so one thing that uh, has caused that to develop is because so many people preach that you have faith in just where you place your faith. Like all men have faith, just place your faith here and place your faith there. Now that comes from a misinterpretation of uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3, where it says, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. Now, in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, chapter 12 is the gifts of the Spirit, and he's talking to Christians. If you look at the first two verses and everything, he's talking to them, brethren, you know, um, he, he calls them brethren. It's a gifts of the Spirit chapter. So, every man he's talking to there is a child of God who has a measure of faith. But now the same Apostle Paul says in Second Thessalonians 3, 2, writing back to the People, he said, pray for us that we be delivered from evil and wicked men in whom is no faith. See, evil and wicked men are those who have not received God's word. They don't have faith. They're in unbelief. So he's not teaching in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 3, that all people are born with faith. But yet that's what these other people are teaching, like Dr. Jeremiah and Dr. Stanley. When they say, place your faith in Jesus, they're saying, like, you are born with faith. Now place it in Jesus. And, and you know, it doesn't make sense. You can't because you can't take something you've received the Lord like His Word and you receive it into your heart like that and, and place it somewhere. You can receive it into your heart, but that's it. It's not something like you got money in your billfold, you walk around, you take it out, and you place your money here and place your money there. No, faith is not like it at all. Um, well, it's time for another break here, so I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. K98 
K98Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at R-A-H-A-R-D-I-N dot com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Here's a few tips in finding Richard's podcast. Go to the World Wide Web at k98talk.com. Scroll down to Podcasts. When Podcast comes up, look for a red button with a white plus sign in it. Open this content in a new window by clicking the link. When a new website appears, click on Shows. Then scroll to God's Pure Word of Faith. Click on the name and a list of programs will come up. That's it. Now enjoy God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden. Welcome back. I'm going to continue now on this uh, discussion of faith and what some of the ministers around our country are sharing about faith. We just got through sharing that you can't place your faith here and place your faith there. It doesn't work like that. When you hear God's Word and God brings something to you to teach a class or to work with young people or that you're a sinner, that you need to get saved and like this, when God brings a message and manifests it in your mind, it is a living God Himself. It's not just a message from Him. It's Him, He Himself manifesting His Spirit in our mind to create a pattern in our mind that we call a thought. And He gives us these thoughts in and, and speaks to us that way to tell us what to do and things. We have to either accept His Word or reject it to unbelief. Like the children of Israel, when they came up to the Promised Land, rejected in Hebrews chapter 3. Read that. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. It says, They were departing from the living God. They hardened their heart and departing from the living God. It says, They failed to enter in because of an evil heart of unbelief. When we hear God's Word and He manifests His Word to us and we reject His Word, that's from a heart that's you know so hard we don't love him enough now I mean, even Christians reject his word like if you call to lead a devotional or call to teach a class or call to preach or something like this and, and, and you don't trust God enough to help you do it see you can reject unbelief you're an unbelief a lot of Christians are in unbelief in a lot of areas of their life because you know just like the promises if we inherit the promises by faith well there's a lot of promises people are neglecting in their life that that the Lord has available. In fact, He wanted so much for us to experience all of His promises that the Scripture says that He double sealed them. He spoke the promises, then He swore by an oath that He wouldn't violate them or that He would back them up. Now, so um, you, you, faith is not something you can just place here and place there or speak into somebody else. Faith is only comes when you hear and receive God's word into your heart. Now, if you're sharing God's word with somebody else, they can receive faith from God's word too. That's why we as ministers are supposed to be sharing God's pure word so that when they accept and receive what we share, that they too then will receive faith from those words of faith. 
but uh, faith is not something like money. You can just take out your billfold and place your faith here and place your faith there. Anytime you hear somebody say something about placing your faith, you'll know then that they're believing that all people have faith. You just place it here and here and here, and that's not true. That is totally untrue. Now, Andrew Womack out of what is it, Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, he says about faith, Romans 12, 3, they all have faith, faith of Jesus. Now, and this is the way he explains it. Jesus' faith is in us. Because of he goes on based on 1 Corinthians 6, 17, says, He that is joined into the Lord is one spirit. Yes, we're one spirit. But let's take a look at Jesus' faith. He says, Jesus' faith is in us. Now, because we're joined one spirit, he says, In my spirit I am totally changed in spirit realm and have Jesus' faith in me. No, you have Jesus' Spirit in you. It says, we're all given the exact same faith in the Spirit realm. We all have the faith of the Son of God. It is not our faith. It is God's faith in us. We have the faith of God. I don't know how, you know, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. I guess if God speaks to himself, you know, like that, and he obeys what he says, you know, he'd have faith. But, you know, that don't make sense. God having faith. God is the one who speaks the words. We're the ones that hear it. And we must receive his words into our heart then to receive faith, see. So we don't have Jesus' faith in us. We have his spirit, like in the, what is it, Galatians 4, 6, and because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, his son Jesus, sent forth the spirit of his son Jesus into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore you no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then heir of God through Christ. See, it's through Christ. The spirit of God's son, Jesus, was Christ. So he sends the spirit of his son, Christ, into our heart. We're a joint heir with Jesus in. A joint heir with all of God's promises. And he loves us just as much as he loved Jesus and everything. But see, we don't have Jesus' faith. What was Jesus' faith? Jesus says in John, I only say what my Father tells me to say. Now see, that's Jesus' faith. He accepts his Father's word and only says what his Father tells him to say. And then another verse in John says, I only do what my Father tells me to do. So he accepts his Father's word of what he was to do, and then he does what his Father tells him to do. Now that's Jesus' perfect walk of faith, accepting what his Father says and obeying and doing what his Father tells him to do. That was his faith. See, but now our faith has got to be the same way that when God speaks to us, we hear what our Father says and we accept and obey the faith. We do what he tells us to do. We say what he tells us to say. That's our faith. And in 1 John 5, 4, the scripture says, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Let's see. This saying that, you know, we got Jesus' faith in us and stuff like this and everything like that, it just shows a complete misunderstanding of what faith is. And our ministers across the nation and everything, you can speak faith into somebody and um, you don't place your faith here and there. You know, faith is based on your response to God's word. If you receive God's word into your heart, you're receiving it to faith. I say to faith because if you reject it, you're rejecting to unbelief. You have the choice, the free will choice, either to receive God's word into your heart to faith or reject it to unbelief. And he'll honor either choice you make and either choice I make. You know, he won't force us to accept his word. He won't, you know, certainly won't force us to reject it. So now, but um, this worldwide ministry, uh, Andrew Warwick saying that, you know, it just we have the faith of Jesus. See, that's can't, we can't have somebody else's faith. Michael Youssef, one of the big ministers around the country and world through you know, the TBN and um, Daystar and other Christian radios and networks, he says we have three faiths. He says we have a saving faith, a daily faith, and a faith in death. Well, I don't know what he means about the faith in death. I don't know faith in death except that I know that when I drop off this physical body, what we call a physical death like that, I'm just going to go to the Spirit to be with the Lord. But a saving faith, a daily faith, well, I tell you what, if even if you're a Christian and you got a problem coming along, something like that, and we have them nowadays, people being persecuted and everything like that, um, we need saving faith, you know, most of our life. 
but I know he's talking about here saving at salvation. You know, um, the faith for receiving God's word into our heart for salvation. And a daily faith, we walk by faith, receiving God's word into our heart as we walk along. But I don't know what he means here by faith and death. Faith is, um, and he says, faith is our total confidence and trust in God. That should lead us to faith. That's right. If, if God speaks to us to say, like, for example, you've never led a devotional. He says, I want you to lead a devotional next um, Sunday evening in your church or, you know, whatever. Uh, you've got to have the confidence of knowing, even though you've never led a devotional before, that the Lord has one he wants you to give. First, hmm, you may not know what it is right now, but, you know, you've got to trust that uh, for some reason or another he wants you to do that. Yeah, you've got to have that confidence that you can do it if the Lord wants you to, and he helps you. So you've got to trust him that he will give you the words to share and then lead you and guide you as you seek to, you know, prepare for that devotional and that he'll give you the strength to do it. So many people say, well, I've never done that before. Oh, so-and-so is more qualified than I am to teach that class. You know, I can't work with young people. I'm too old. I, you know, I, I don't understand what they're doing nowadays. But if God calls you to teach those young people, work with them, see, he'll help you and, and you'll be a blessing to them. Or like if uh, God calls you to teach with, you know, the older people like uh, 70 year olds and 80 year olds stuff like that and everything some of you young people say well I, I can't talk to them old people and everything like that they don't you know I don't understand anything about that but see if God calls you to teach and preach or you know teach the old people or the young people or whatever don't you trust him enough that he knows what he's doing he knows what's best for you and for them and that he will help you and lead and guide you as you do it see you've got to trust and put that confidence in him see Trust and faith is very different. You've got to trust God enough to accept his words to faith. The children of Israel, they came up to the promised land. They didn't trust God enough that he would take care of them from those giants over there. The, the spies came back and said, there's giants in the land, where's grasshoppers to them. See, so they didn't trust God, so they rejected his will and word to unbelief. And that's the way it is so many people in, a, in the churches and everything day. If, if you've got a church right now and you've got five or six, ten or fifteen vacancies where people need to be serving, that means you've got five, ten or fifteen people that are rejecting God's word to faith. Because he's calling them to, because he wants all of us to be in some type of service. He wants all of us to be working like that. But they're just rejecting the unbelief and aren't filling those positions. So you can, you can uh, measure how much um, unbelief in the people in your church is, but how many vacancies you have that need somebody in there serving the Lord. Anyway, that's a free little commercial there for serving the Lord. Anyway, but you know, faith is personal between us and God, between you and God, me and God, like that, our faith. We don't have Jesus' faith, like Andrew Warmick says here, uh, just because we have his spirit in us See, God has a call and, and a personal walk with each of us that he wants to talk to us about as we walk through here. And we talk to him and he, you know, responds back to us and he wants us to just follow him along like that. Jesus had his walk of faith that prepared the way and he was the author and finisher of our faith as far as, you know, the instructions and how to do it and everything like that. But uh, as Andrew Wong says, we do not have Jesus' faith in us. We have his spirit in us, the spirit of Christ, the same spirit of Christ that was in Jesus, in us, the living word of God. Now, again, all have faith. Brian, let's see, what is it? Brian Houston uh, from Australia that's on a lot of the worldwide TV networks and everything like that. He says, every man has faith. Again, that's like we mentioned before. And, and then we teach in, if every man has faith, you just place your faith here and place your faith there. And it's what you do with it that's important. That's not true. See, every man doesn't have faith. In, um, well, in fact, the first time the word faith is used, if you uh, look up in the concordance, the first time the word faith was used, God invented it. In Deuteronomy 32, 20, he said, my children are so, you know, forward. They're, you know, so sinful. He says, they have no faith. That's the first time the word faith was used. So all these people that say everybody has faith and everything evidently didn't look in concordance and look up, you know, how faith with faith was used in different places because the first time it's used in the whole Bible is God saying his children are so forward, they're, you know, so sinful, they have no faith. And then in Mark 4.40, when the disciples came to Jesus and said, uh, 
uh, Master, Master, we're going to perish. The winds and the waves and everything, the storm. Jesus got up, spoke to the storm. Now, you'll notice throughout the scriptures when, when Jesus spoke to uh, physical things of God's creation, they all obeyed him. See, everything in the universe has to obey God's word except you and me. We're the only part of his creation that has the choice to reject God's word. When, when Jesus stood up from that boat in and said, Peace be still, those winds and the waves had to obey him. They had no choice. They obeyed him or still. But then he turned to the disciples. This is Mark 440 now if you want to look it up. He said, Why do you have no faith? Why do you have no faith? Because see, he had told them he was going to go over to the other side and everything like this. They had heard his word. They had heard the words he had spoken to. And now here, uh, because of fear, the devil torment them and everything. And you know, fear does that. The devil will come in. Every time you uh, start feeling any kind of fear, it's the devil coming to you. And uh, what does it say in Timothy 1, 7? God has not given us a spirit of fear. See, f the spirit of fear is the spirit of the devil. It's not just an emotion or something. Now, he creates strong emotions in you and everything, but he comes in to torment you so that you can't find God's will and everything. So anytime fear starts coming on you, let that be a red flag to start praying and seeking God for what you're doubting him about. The disciples here were doubting that God was going to perfect, I mean, protect them and, and save them from this storm. But Jesus said, why do you have no faith? And in 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, where Apostle Paul prayed that they be delivered from evil and wicked men in whom is no faith. So see, every man does not have faith. Babies aren't born of faith. Faith comes from us making an intelligent choice of receiving God's word into our heart. When he speaks to us, receiving his word in our heart. Now, Jimmy Swaggart says, Place your faith in what Jesus did on the cross, and he will give you all the grace you need to live the Christian life. So, you place your faith in what Jesus did on the cross. I guess because, you know, God was speaking to you through some message teaching you about the cross and something like this. And, and you accept and receive that into your heart then about Jesus dying on the cross and uh, taking our sins like I mentioned earlier. When Christ left him, the man Jesus on the cross took our sins as a scapegoat and like that. Um, then he says, he will give you all the grace you need to live the Christian life. No, he'll give you all the grace you need for salvation. When you place your faith, not place your faith here, I'm saying it myself. When you receive God's word that Jesus died on the cross for us and our sins, we must humble ourselves to him and invite the spirit of Christ into our heart. And we do that. See, we're receiving then the faith of those words into our heart they come alive in us and work the work of grace in us to create a new heart a new life in us but it doesn't stop there the next day you know like that when God wants to teach us to quit smoking I say I keep saying that because I was smoking when I became a Christian when I prayed that night but I part of my prayer was Lord if you really real like that Bible says come in and show me uh, I want to have that relationship with you like the Bible talks about or something like this but I put in there, I said, I'm not going to change anything until I know for sure it's you now. And I know you're real. I'm not going to quit smoking. I'm not going to quit drinking. I'm not going to quit anything until I know it's you. And then I will. And, uh, you know, when he did start showing me then, that's a, that's a long story. I don't have time to share it right now and everything like that. But uh, how God really delivered me of cigarettes and everything like that. I knew that it was hurting my testimony, sharing with people how great this God was that I had just received into my heart and how he made such great changes in my life. And then I'd light up a cigarette to calm my nerves. You know, that was totally contradictory. And I knew it was, but that's one of the hardest things to do to quit smoking and, and, and like it struggling with everything. But I kept trying and kept trying. And, uh, well, I'll tell you a brief story, but I was a flight training officer with 20-something cadets at a camp, and um, they were doing real good and everything. They had won all their softball games, won all their volleyball games, and they were just a top uh, um, 
cadets in the whole camp. My flight was, and it was just, it was great and everything. But one day they started arguing, bickering back and forth, and they lost both of them. The first losses they had was because of bickering and fighting. So I called them in and, you know, going to chew them out that night. Got them sitting down the hallway, you know, that barracks and everything. And I, I don't remember what else I said, but I talked to them about, you, you're better than this. You can do better than that. And then right at the end, these words came out of me. I said, I'm not mad at you, just hurt. You know what to do, and you won't do it. Man, I thought, that sounds good. I can't say anything to beat that. So I just turned around, click, 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 walked out of the barracks and just left them dumbfounded, something like that. As I started down the steps, I reached in my pocket to get a cigarette. And all of a sudden, as I started putting that cigarette to my mouth, it was just like a, a megaphone or something like that spoke in my head. I'm not mad at you, just hurt. You know what to do, and you won't do it. And I put that cigarette down. And I knew it was God speaking to me. He wasn't mad. He was just hurt because I was not being the testimony for him that I could be, that I should be, of a God that can not only, you know, save my soul, but he can, you know, deliver me of cigarettes. And uh, and anyway, that's how the Lord spoke to me to quit smoking and everything. But now, I, you know, what he's saying here, Jimmy Swagger, place your faith in what Jesus did on the cross. So as we hear about the cross and how he died for us and everything like that, we accept his words and into our heart. He will give you all the grace you need to live the Christian life. Well, he'll give you the, all the grace you need to get started. He'll create in you the new heart, the new life. But we've got to receive his words of faith to teach a class into us and then that work of grace in our heart then to teach a class. He will help us teach it. Things like this. So that's just beginning of our walk with the Lord, walking in grace. It's it's not the beginning and the end. Our our total walking in the just shall live by faith. See, and every time we accept and receive God's word in our heart, we're receiving um, more of the living word in us about a different area, and that work of grace in us then continues. We continue to grow in measures of grace. Jesus came in the fullness of grace, but we grow in measures as we receive more of God's word into our heart. Now, uh, a couple more of these here. Andrew Warmack again uh, stated that Moses struck the rock and nothing happened. Numbers chapter 20, uh, verse 11, it says that water came out of the rock. God let the water come out to the people and everything, but Moses, and if you look back, you don't hear it very often, but if you look back at that story, Aaron was evidently involved with Moses some way or another in disobeying God's word here because Aaron got relieved of his um, ministerial duties then and died just very shortly after that. God put up another priest, um, and then Moses then didn't get to enter into the promised land. But that water did come out of the rock. Now, it seems to me like a person, you know, uh, given a story on that, would read it and at least know that, that much about it and everything. Because, see, that's not sharing God's true word there. That's mixing in that uh, evil. Now, for a uh, word of faith movement here, this uh, uh, a lot of things here. We're getting close to break, but I'm going to start this story and then I'll get it... Uh, going after the break. Jesse's plan, as Kenneth Copeland said, that, that Joseph's life and works were God's grace on him. See, there wasn't any grace in the Old Testament. So when you're speaking things like that, people can't receive those words you're speaking to faith because they're error and they're wrong. See, like in um, Psalms 25.10, it says, mercy and truth are all the ways of the Lord to those that love him and obey his testimonies. And Isaiah says, God says the covenant was my spirit on you and my words in your mouth. And so when you aren't sharing the truth like that, it sounds good that uh, there might have been grace in the Old Testament, but there wasn't. That's why God um, changed the covenant. He wanted to bring us into his family. Ezekiel 36, 26 again. A new heart also will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, and put my spirit in you. And that's when we become a child of God, when he puts his spirit in us and lives in our heart. 
Um, now, Jesse says here on Daystar, faith is Hebrews 11. Faith is things, which I mentioned earlier. And he says that uh, faith is so much, you know, the, the words are so strong and everything like that. And uh, Jesse also says he takes control of the weather to go fishing. He says he can take control of the weather, go fishing, have a good day and a pretty day and everything like this. Uh, but now, so many teach in that movement, you know, the Word of Faith movement and everything like that. Uh, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savelle, Frederick Price, and many, many more preachers, you know, in every city across our country, you know, and, um, and many followers like that, millions of them like that. Um, they believe it's just, it's true that Jesse can take control of the water. They can take control. If, you know, words are full of force, and you speak those words, and that forth goes, that force goes forth. No, faith comes by hearing God's word and receiving His word into your heart. See, then He performs a work of grace in you for whatever He's spoken to you, and then the Christ then performs in our life whatever it is he spoken to us. Now, uh, I don't have time right now. Okay, I'll be back right after the break and we'll continue that then. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we're expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level, or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget. Web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rail. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord. Right here on K98 Talk, and the Spark Radio Network. Welcome back. Now we have about 30 minutes left. I'm going to try to share with you as much as I can. I was talking about the Word of Faith movement and Jesse DePlan is saying that he can control the weather uh, when he goes fishing just by speaking to it. And uh, Many others across the nation, millions of people across the nation um, go along with that, what's called the Word of Faith movement, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savelle, Frederick Price, and many, many more. Now, if this is true, that Jesse can uh, control the weather, and that Mark 11.23 says we can have what we say. Now, Mark 11.23 Jesus says, Have faith in God. Whosoever shall say in this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, 
and not doubting. Now, not doubting is a, a key expression here because how can you not doubt something? The only way you can not doubt something is that you prayed and prayed on your knees and sought the Lord. And when he speaks to you then, he clears up that doubt like Jehoshaphat. Now, when Jehoshaphat was surrounded by three armies in Second Chronicles chapter 20, it says he feared. Somebody told him, three armies surround you, king. Feared, set himself to seek the Lord. He didn't know what to do, but he knew where to go to get the answer. They, Judah prayed and fasted three days, and then God spoke and said, uh, It's my battle and not yours. Go set yourself in the valley of Ziz and see the victory. He, you know, he got his doubt removed. He heard from God. He trusted God enough then that the next morning they marched out of the gates. You know, without weapons, sit out here and watch. And all three of the armies were killed the last man. They were so lustful and everything those armies were, they didn't want to share with each other then because they saw it was going to be so easy, just a bunch of silly um, Jews coming out, you know, no weapons or anything. We don't need to share this with those other two armies. And they killed each other the last man. See, but... Jehoshaphat got out of doubt by setting himself to seek the Lord. And that's the way we get out of doubt. You know, like at any time fear starts to just to manifest itself in you, something like that, take it to the Lord in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for them, but in all things with prayer and supplication, let your request be known to God. Don't wait till you got a super problem. Or like Jehoshaphat here, he started with a super problem. Three armies surrounding him. But, you know, most of the time we start getting kind of anxious about something. And Philippians 4, 6 says, start praying then. Don't wait till later. But now, Mark eleven twenty three. Have faith in God. Whosoever shall send this mountain, be thou removed. And not doubting you've got God's word to you on it. Whosoever shall send this mountain, be thou removed. They are cast and see, and not doubting, but believing. See, now you believing what you've heard there. You know it's from God. You believe it. Shall have whatsoever he saith. So see, the key to the Mark eleven twenty three then is that you've prayed about your situation, and God has told you, like he told Jehoshaphat, march out of the gate singing praises. David sought the Lord one time, and God told him, go over and wait for the rustle of the mulberry bush. See? So that's what he had to do. He had to tell his generals and everything, we got to go over and wait for the rustling of the mulberry bush. Then God will go before us. See, it's that's what Mark eleven twenty three says. Jesus said, have faith in God. That means hear from God, accept and obey what he says. And whosoever shall say in this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast seed, and not doubting, but believing shall have whatsoever he saith. But see, you're saying what God has told you to say, not something you've just made up to say. And just confessing your own words and everything. And you got to say it. If, if the Lord tells you to go over to the neighbor and pray for him to be healed, you don't go over there and say, uh, let me pray for you. Maybe you'll be healed. See, you don't add to it. You don't change. You say, the Lord told me to come over and pray for you and you'd be healed. See, you got to speak his word faithfully that he gives you. Now, so, Jesse's going to take control of the weather with his words and everything. And if now... Jesse and the rest of the uh, Word of Faith movement truly believes what he and others in the Word of Faith ministers preach. Jesse or one of his buddies or one of the millions of followers somewhere in the Word of Faith movement across the country should have confessed something or did something to, to take control of Kat Hurricane Katrina and stop it from hitting New Orleans. Why didn't they at least say one of the thousands of Word of Faith ministers or believers somewhere, why didn't they speak up and do something? Now, that Sunday morning, I heard Jesse Duplantis, Dr. Jesse's uh, message here on, in Oklahoma City on Channel 5, 9 o'clock that morning, the same Sunday that Katrina was coming toward New Orleans. Just hours before uh, Katrina hit New Orleans that night, and he preached, and he says, we Cajuns aren't afraid of hurricanes. We just take control of them and cast them back out in the Gulf. Now, see, he had his, head, he had his headquarters in down there in New Orleans. That same message played again on Tuesday and Thursday, one time on Trinity Broadcasting Network, another time on Daystar, after New Orleans had just got wiped out. It was still playing, and he says, we Cajuns aren't afraid of hurricanes. We just take control of them and cast them back out in the ocean. Now, Looks like at least 
one of them in the Word of Faith movement, him or one of his buddies or something across the country, would have said something about that hurricane. Didn't they care enough about New Orleans to at least say something? Also, where were all the great confessions today about uh, terrorism? What are they saying about terrorism if they can have everything they say? Or about the drug war, about abortion, about crime, border control, AIDS, Ebola, and other social problems. You know, it's a bit we can have what we say. If you really believe that, for any of you out there in the Word of Faith movement, start saying some things that will help our society, help our country, and, and help get people turned back to the Lord in our country. Start saying those things. But most of the confessions that I've heard or something like that are about building bigger buildings or uh, getting a fancy car or something or, or airplane or money or something. See, so if, if you really believe what you're teaching and preaching, try to live it. I had a gentleman one time, a minister, go with me to uh, a radio station. I had a radio program years ago. And uh, as we was out there, people calling, sharing testimonies and all this. And it was great. And he just really enjoyed it and everything like that. And, and he happened to mention something about, you know, uh, that there's a scripture that says, you know, thy and thy family will be saved. And um, he said, that's a promise. God promises all our families will be saved and everything like that. I said, uh, based on your prayer, your saying that you pray for your family, each of your family, and they will all be saved? He said, yes. You know, God will somehow or another make them be saved or something like that. No, that don't work that way. You can, we pray for our loved ones and friends and God will bless them. God will bless them so much and, and send witnesses to them, you know, to help them have a good day, you know, uh, protect them today. You know, help them be successful in whatever they're doing. But most of all, Lord, help them know that it's you and your love and your presence. But when it comes down to it in the end, God will not force anybody to accept him based on our prayers. They've got to make the choice himself. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I can, I can pray and, and, and my children, my wife, you know, everybody like that. Uh, I pray for will be saved. I said, well, what are we doing wasting time out the radio station then? Let's just pull over the side of the road and start praying for Oklahoma City and just pray until Oklahoma City gets saved. And then we can move down to Dallas and we can, and we can just start praying for everybody to get saved. But see, yes, we should be praying for God to send His Spirit to people and give them the opportunities and everything like that. But God will not force someone to receive Him into their heart because of our prayers. He'll do everything. He'll send witnesses to them. He'll bless them with, uh, you know, uh, well, it says in, what is it, Romans chapter 2, 4, that God blesses lost people to draw them to repentance. He'll, he'll send blessings to them and, and things like this based on our prayers. He'll protect them. And, well, when um, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, it says in Genesis 19, and God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. See, it wasn't based on Lot's life and everything. Lot had done compromised himself so much living in Sodom and Gomorrah with those people and everything that it, it, he wasn't saved because of, or from that destruction and everything, because of his status with God. It says God remembered Abraham and delivered Lot. So our children, God remembers us a lot and delivers our children thing, but he won't force them to receive him as personal Lord and Savior. Now, and going on about faith here. Let's see. In, uh, well, in 1 Kings, there's a story about Elijah. And uh, so many people say, well, Elijah, you know, you remember him as a prophet that called down fire out of heaven. Well, it's not just that he called down fire out of heaven. Here, Andrew Warmuck, in, uh, in teaching about this, says Jesus would have condemned Elijah for calling fire down and killing 200 and something false prophets. Now, is that true? Well, it, for whatever he was trying to use that to back up, if you uh, look in 1 Kings chapter 18, what happened was that uh, God told Elijah to do what he was doing. Now, I, what uh, Andrew was talking about was in Luke chapter 9. Uh, it says in, 
They sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, for Jesus. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? See, and that's the disciples turned to Jesus. But then Jesus answered here, but Jesus turned and rebuked him and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. See, it, when somebody does something to us or hurts us, uh, you know, it's not God's will to you know, strike them down to punish them for that and everything. And that's what he was telling them here. You know, uh, Jesus wants us to be the kind of witness that those people can be delivered from whatever it was in them that the devil was doing in them that caused them to hurt us. Like, for example... Um, I meet so many people that have things in their past, you know, like an ex-husband, ex-wife, or, or a, a boss that caused them to get fired, or somebody lied about them, things like that, and, and they're holding this bitterness and this uh, unforgiveness to them. See, that's not God's will. In uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, it says, Forgive others, lest you give Satan advantage. It's not God's will for you to hold that, and it's causing you to be out of fellowship with God Failing to get answers to prayer and everything, and you're giving the devil advantage in your life. And there's many people today suffering because of holding unforgiveness. So what I tell them is, whatever that person did to hurt you, it wasn't God working through that person to hurt you. It had to be the devil working through it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, and so I say, okay, God wants that person to be set free of the devil as much as he wants me and you and others to, because he doesn't want that person to hurt any more people like that. Oh, yes, that's right, yeah. I say, well, then start praying God's will for that person, that that person be set free from whatever the devil's doing, you know, and, and causing in, in his life or her life or whoever it is, something like that. Pray for them to be set free every time you think about them. Instead of you getting all upset and mad and hurt again and feeling bad and everything, when the devil reminds you of that person, pray for that person to be delivered and set free of the devil. And then, you know, pray for God to bless them. And, and like this, that they will come and turn to the Lord and become a child of God too and a Christian. And, and if you keep doing that over and over, one day you'll think and you say, oh, yes, I would like to see God bless that person. I'd like to see God bless that person and save that person. And you'll know you've forgiven them. But more than, I mean, even along with that, you will have been set free of that unforgiveness in your heart. And God will have blessed you in so many ways now, and that's what uh, Jesus was telling disciples here when he said, command fire to come down on them. He said, that's not it. He doesn't want to destroy those people. And in Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, God doesn't rejoice in the death of any wicked person, but that the wicked turn from their way and live. So God wants us to join with him and pray for those people that have hurt us, that they be delivered from that. And that's what Jesus was telling disciples here. He turned and rebuked him and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are. The uh, Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And then they went to another village. But see, so so Andrew Warmack then says that Jesus would have uh, condemned um, Elijah for calling down this fire on his prophets. But now let's read what's in 1 Kings 18 and just see about that. And it came to pass on the time of the offering of the evening that Elijah the prophet came near and said. Now, see, uh, the contest was between Elijah's God and two or three hundred uh, false gods of the false prophets. And the false prophets had taken them all morning long and uh, had beat themselves and cut themselves and you know had sacrifices and all this stuff to their false gods and, and they didn't hear them or anything. And Elijah taunted them during that time and says, uh, scream louder, scream louder because your God may be asleep. Maybe he's not listening to you. Maybe he's asleep or gone out somewhere and can't hear you. <coughs> well, it, uh, after, after they got through like that and it came Elijah's turn, he went over and told them, pour water on the sacrifice. He built the altar and put you know the wood and everything for sacrifice and everything on it. He said, pour water on it, pour water on it. He, three or four times like it, just soaked it in water. And then when he got through like that, all these false prophets standing around, the king standing around, everybody watching him and everything, and he's making a big deal out of it. When he gets ready then, this is what Elijah did. It says, And it came 
to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and, now listen here, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. See, God told him to do those things. God told him to go out there. God wanted to be glorified, and he used Elijah then to go out and face all those false prophets and false gods and everything like that, and, and to do this to show people that he was God, that he'd be glorified. Now, this is his prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am the servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. See, he's accepted God's word ahead of time and received God's word to faith, and he's gone there and done that because God told him to. He's walking by faith accepting and obeying God's word to him. So Jesus would not have destroyed Elijah I mean, uh, yeah, for doing this. And then it says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell from heaven, consumed the burnt offering in the wood. Now see, Elijah didn't call down fire. Elijah just prayed to the Lord, God sent down fire. That's like Jesus. People say, well, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus didn't raise Lazarus from the dead. In uh, John chapter 11, verse 41, Jesus prayed and said, Father, I know thou hearest me always, but I say these things that the people here might know that thou hast sent me. Then he said, Lazarus, come forth. See, God answered his prayer. Jesus prayed in front of those people that they might hear his prayer and see his answer. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. God raised Lazarus from the dead and brought him forth. The Spirit of Christ back into Lazarus, you know, something like that. But see, Jesus was just a mouthpiece like this to show. And if you look on down in two or three verses after that, Mark, let's say, what, John eleven forty one. About verse 43, 44, it said that many of those people that were standing around about then believed on Jesus because of that. And that's why he prayed out loud, to give them a sign. But Jesus prayed, and the Spirit of Christ entered into Lazarus again and brought him forth. God's living word then, something like that. Just like here for Isaiah. Um, Isaiah didn't call down fire. Isaiah did what he was told to do, and God sealed it with what he told well, um, Elijah, that he was going to do. Then the fire of the Lord fell. It happened again when they were dedicating the temple a couple of times, you know, between Solomon and, and God, that God sent his fire then to seal the promises and everything. But it said, And the fire from the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust, licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. They took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them. Now, it also said that uh, there's some of them, the, let's say the Bible answer man and Andrew Warmer said that uh, Elijah was working in fear here. Now, what, where they get that from is very when... Uh, Ahab's wife uh, heard about it. She said, to, "You know that I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow for killing these false prophets and stuff like that." So, uh, anyway, you got to check out what uh, people are saying. Everything because it, it seems like if, if you listen to these different radio stations and uh, TV stations, and you say, "Well, those are just radio preachers." Well, they're radio preachers who've been through the same seminaries that that your preachers have been through that, you know, preaching your churches, stuff like that. They've been through the same seminaries, the same Bible schools, the same like this, most of them. And uh, they're just sharing what they were taught as they went through these. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, a Baptist seminary only teaches people how to interpret the Scriptures according to Baptist beliefs. The Presbyterian seminaries teach how to interpret the Scriptures according to Presbyterian. Catholic according to Catholic. And, and so on like this, you know, if, if you took a Baptist uh, student that was fixing to take his final exam for the seminary or something like that, 
I took him over and had him take the Catholic uh, finals, he'd flunk. And the Catholic student would flunk in the Baptist, you know, like that. So they aren't going to seminaries to learn God's pure word. They're going to seminaries to how to influence you to believe their particular denominational beliefs. And, and that's the main thing they get out of it, you know. And that's why we continue to have so many different uh, denominations and different beliefs in our society and everything because they're not looking for, like in Ephesians 4, the one Lord, one faith. We're supposed to have one faith and um, that would be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro. So our um, Christian society is a bunch of babes in Christ in all denominations. Yeah. And they're taught, don't speak about anything that might be a little controversial, something like this. You know, you don't have to stir up anything like this. Just preach right down the center of the road, God's love and this. and that. But, but don't, any of these differences like that, don't bring them up. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> I don't know. Here's a, the Bible answer man stated about Elijah. said he operated in fear and uh, fire came down by an act of God and had nothing to do with his prayer. Well, I don't know why he prayed it to him if it didn't have anything to do with it, but God told him what to do, and his prayer explains that. And on, it's just that uh, our society, even though we have all these different copies of the Bibles, and there's, I got one Bible here that has 26 different copies of it compared to the King James. Um, NIV leaves out about 20. 20 something verses that King James has uh, they just skip right through them and one of them is after Mark 11 23, 24, 26 it says when you stand pray and forgive uh, lest your heavenly father won't forgive you it's left out of the NIV and different things uh, different uh, denominations teaching right opposite other denominations see both can't be right in fact both could be wrong but they both can't be right. One's got to be right and one's wrong at least. Uh, all these different beliefs and things. And uh, that's why God is not blessing our nation like it is. What's in Washington, D.C., what's going on up there, the crooks and everything, are just a result of the failure of Christianity in our society. Not failure of Christ now, but the failure of Christianity to seek and join together in the one faith, the love of God, because he won't tell us all different things. After 9-11, people flocked to the churches. And for two or three weeks like that, it looked like, man, there's going to be a revival in our country. But within six weeks, they quit going back to church. They went back looking for answers and strength, and they didn't find it. And from what I've heard, now I don't know this to be true, but that more people left the churches after that that actually fled back to the church because of their fear in 9-11. That um, the attendance was leaving less about six weeks or so after that. Anyway, uh, God's living pure word is what each of us are going to have to answer for when we stand before Jesus or stand before Christ on the judgment day, uh, judgment seat of Christ. It says that we're going to, yeah, so many times you hear that we're going to receive our blessings and crowns and things like that. It just sounds like going to be so much fun and everything. But then it says on down there, and it says that we're all going to answer for the good and bad. Now, the good is great to answer for that, but what's the bad? The bad's going to be any unforgiven sins that we have that we carry there. Like, for example, one big sin that many are going to have to answer for is like in Second Second Timothy one nine, where he saved us and called us to holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, created in Christ Jesus before the world began. It's it's an act of sin to not seek his perfect calling, his holy calling for your life. In Second Chronicles twelve fourteen, it says Rehoboam, Solomon's son, did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. It's evil for us not to seek God's will for our life. It's evil for us to uh, hold unforgiveness against someone. Second Corinthians two ten eleven again says, "Forgive others, lest you give Satan advantage." You're giving Satan advantage because it's evil to hold unforgiveness, and that means you're out of fellowship with God. You're failing to get answers to prayer, and you're failing this. See, so the devil's going to come in and bring bad things in your life. Then 
sicknesses and curses and all this type of stuff while you're holding unforgiveness. And uh, husbands, dwell your wives according to knowledge and being joint heirs of grace of life. Lest your prayers be hindered, it says in 1 Peter 3, 7. Now see, your prayers are going to be hindered because you're going to be out of fellowship. If you're out of fellowship with your wife like that, if you're out of fellowship with your children, with your pastor, with you know, your boss at work, or employees, you know, work with you at work, you're like this. You know, while you're out of fellowship with them and holding these grudges and things like this, and, and instead of praying for those who despitefully use you, you're arguing back and fighting and everything to get your way. See, that's not what the Lord wants for us. And so those are the things we're going to have to answer for judgment seat of Christ that are bad, unforgiven sins. Think about that now because, you know, even as Christians, we have sinful acts that we've committed of holding grudges and unforgiveness. We need to get them right here on earth. And not have to wait till we stand before the Lord and, and answer to Him for Him. Because it says we're each of us going to answer for the good and the bad. You don't hear that much in the sermons and everything. But I tell you, I pray that any of you listening right now, if you haven't received Christ in your heart, turn to Him with all your heart and just say, Oh God, Lord, please forgive me my sins. Send your Spirit to live in my heart. And I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray. You know, just an honest, simple prayer between you and God will change your eternity. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. Visit Richard's website at raharden.com. That's the World Wide Web at rahardin.com. At his website, you can see a summary of the six books he has written, where purchases may be made. He also has a link to 18 videos on YouTube and several blogs about Christian beliefs. If you prefer, visit Amazon.com backslash Kindle and type in Richard Harden to see and purchase his books. The staff of K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network is proud to announce that our very own Rowdy Rick Robinson has been selected as one of the top conservative talk show hosts in the nation for his program, America Off the Rails. Again, congratulations to Rowdy Rick Robinson for a job well done and another reason to stay connected to K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. K98 Talk is expanding its lineup for 2015. This means we are expanding our advertising base. Whether you're a startup trying to push through to the next level or an established business trying to supplement your advertising budget, web-based advertising is a solid investment. Thanks to Talk's newest partnership with TuneIn Radio and instant access to our sister station, K98 FM, we give you worldwide access at a reasonable cost. Interested parties should email us at advertise at k98talk.org. K98talk.com, a leader in Internet radio. So grab your seatbelts and take the ride of your life on k 98 Talk. God's Pure Word of Faith with Richard Harden can now be heard on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings at 7 a.m. Central, 8 Eastern, and on Sunday mornings at his regular time, 6 Central, 7 Eastern. Join with him and let's turn our country back to God. It only takes a spark to start a forest fire. Let's get on fire for the Lord right here on K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network. 
Texting and driving is a bad combination, and in some states, it's against the law. Do you know that you're in my lane? No, not at all. Are you not paying attention? Are you texting? I was just checking in with my mom. I was telling her that I thought we'd be home by six. It's okay. There's enough time. Just pay attention. I'm not even halfway through my text. There's no way. I'm not even going to look up. My babies are in the car. You have to pay attention. It's just supposed to be a quick text. I'm so sorry. Please don't text and drive. This has been a public service announcement from your friends at K98 Talk, the leader in internet radio.